Hi, I'm Amy Bodkin, and welcome to another special episode of Special Needs Kids Are People Too. I am here with my special guest, Amber O'Neill Johnson, um, also known as Heritage Mom. Amber has been with us before, but she's here with us today because she has some super exciting news that I'm super excited about. She wrote a book! <laughs> <laughs> so I have not read the book yet. So Amber, tell us about the book because I know nothing. Okay, I'm excited. excited to do so. So the book is called A Place to Belong. So everything in the book is pointing to the idea that home is a place where we can incubate our loves and prepare them for the world. Um, and we can do that by celebrating diversity and kinship within our homes. And as we um, help our children to interact with their local and global communities. So um, it's a lot of the things that I usually talk about. Um, people can expect to see chapters on books as mirrors and books as windows and of that, of course, but it's much more expansive because I talk about um, even curating a diverse selection of media choices in which children see themselves and people who are different in various ways. And um, I talk about how to dig into that hard history that we don't have to be afraid of it and um, how important it is for our children to understand and know what happened, but that we can also celebrate cultural heritage, ours and other people's, um, through music and art and poetry and other beautiful things that it's not all tragedy and trial. So I'm really excited about it. I love that. And, you know, I was reading another book just recently called People Love Dead Jews which is quite the um, attention getting title. Yes, it is. <laughs> but I got to thinking about it as I was reading it. And if you think about it, most people, their um, experience with Jewish history, they usually know at least two famous Jews, Jesus and Anne Frank. <laughs> It's Both true. murdered Jews. Yes. That's fantastic. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so it got me thinking, you know, it's kind of like what you've been talking about just within the past year and also in your book, I'm thinking coming up, is that a lot of times the highlights that we highlight in our Western history, the things that we hear about minority groups, is usually not their good highlights. <laughs> Right. Well, we I focus on the, the negative. Right. That and and you know the negative parts are or the the difficult parts. You know the yeah. trials, the tragedies. Those are part of the story, but we don't share enough with our children about the triumphs and the joys and the current live lives that people are living to, lives people are living today. So you know I think about when we, it's almost like when we're mired down in like this really hard and tragic history, we're like, okay, here's the situation, here's what happened. But let's now move on to this other subject where we'll, where we'll leave those people behind and we'll get into the happy stuff or the joyful stuff or the creative stuff. And so my argument is kind of like, hey, let's be inclusive in all of that. So not just our history or our nonfiction, but also our literature. And again, the, the art, the music, the poetry, I talk about nature and even how that ties in um, and can have cultural ties in, within the book. Um, and, you know, fostering conversations and dialogue with our children around what's happening today. And yes, some of that is rooted in history as it is in everything what has happened in the past. Um, bleeds into today, but there are people who are thriving and living and creating and learning and discovering and contributing today, and, and those people need to be part of our homes as well. Oh, yeah, and I mean, I can't think of a better way to learn to appreciate a culture that's not your own than discovering what is beautiful that that culture brings to this world. Absolutely. And I think it's such a, it's a different way of approaching it with our children um, mm -hmm. so that they are looking at people One, they're seeing, they're meeting the humanity that their mm -hmm. shared humanity with people. That's their first introduction to different people groups. Um, and, and it doesn't even have to be just um, kind of global 
inclusivity or diversity, but even I talk about regional. So I have a, a product in my website that's called Sweet Tea and Cookies. And it's a, um, it's kind of a, an ode to the American South. And people are always, when they don't know who created it, they're like, oh gosh, here we go. Again. And I'm like, no, 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 but you gotta read about it. It's not, it, look, look, I created it. It's beautiful. So, I grew up in the Midwest, so did my husband, but our children are Georgian, they're Southern. They were born and raised here in Georgia and everything we read about Georgia was depressing. It was part of the deep South. These were the worst states, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the kids were kind of feeling down about it. And I was like, no, I, every child should feel proud of where they come from, right? And that doesn't mean you think it's better than everybody else's place of origin, but just that you see the beauty of the place to which you belong. And so I wrote this thing about, you know, this lesson, these lesson plans, and it covers art and music and poetry and literature and history and, and candy crafts and all of these things really focused on the states that have the worst reputation in the South for being the number one areas for that chattel slavery. And I just mm -hmm. explained the whole thing for my children. And not that there's no, no mention of what happened here. That's an important part of it, but that there's also food there are all these recipes and sweet tea so each week has a sweet <laughs> recipe a different you know so we have sweet tea we have big porches we have poetry and music and there is plenty for you to be proud of and excited about even if the soil on which you live and grow and learn has a, a past that none of us are proud about or happy about um, yeah. That it doesn't have to be either or, but that it can be both. So some of that mm -hmm. is even within our own country, you know, within our own neighborhoods. And um, yeah. I think it's, it's beautiful because it's accessible to everybody. And growing up in the South, I'm completely with you on that. Um, I have friends that when they were um, in graduate school, they were studying engineering, they'd go travel, and people would always go, so do y'all wear shoes in Mississippi? We're like, Oh my gosh, I can't no. believe you just asked that. Seriously. Yes, of course, we yeah. wear shoes. <laughs> it's a bad reputation, right? Where people who, and I kind of get it because not being from here, I'm just, it, it, and it's it's funny, it's just a really quick story. I had mm -hmm. um, my, both of my boys, I don't know what's up with me and teaching boys to talk, but both of my boys were in speech therapy when they were younger. And one of them, they, they graduated. The speech therapist said, oh, he's done. He doesn't need anymore. And I was like, oh no, I, I don't know what she's talking about. So I hired this other expert to come to our home and to speak with my son and to give us an evaluation. She was like, well, I don't take insurance. I'm like, we'll pay cash. He must learn to speak right. And so she does this huge, long evaluation. She sends the kids out, sends my son out of the room and she says, Mrs. Johnston, she was like, your son doesn't have a speech impediment or anything like that. He's just Southern. <laughs> oh my gosh. She was like, all the examples you gave me, because I was like, like he breaks words up like mama, you know, like mama, like he has these extra syllables and I had like all these examples and she was like, yeah, he's like mama. You know, and I'm like mother dear, and she said so. So she was like, "You just have to realize that your husband, you and your husband, have accents as well. You just don't hear them." And he was born here, and he has picked up an accent more than your other children. And I was so embarrassed. And so it just shows, you know, like we we have our regional differences within country. We have. Um, differences, sure, among ethnicities and cultures, but also learning styles and preferences mm -hmm. and talents and gifts. And um, this is a lot of what I dig into in the book and just talking about how we can choose to create a home atmosphere where all of that is celebrated, where our children feel like they are um, special because they are and that they feel happy to be who they are, who God made them to be. And yeah. even if it's different than the people that they see around them, but that they can walk out and say, I like who I am. And that they realize that they have parents who see them and that their parents like what they see. Well, and that's an excellent point about like special needs. Because like we have an entire community of autistic adults where we all get together and chat online and talk about our own experiences. And when you meet other people who are like you, you're like, oh, this is normal for us. 
I'm yeah. not weird. <laughs> yeah. And I think so that's kind of the part of the idea is like, how can we help our children to see that earlier? You know, as adults, so many of us, I mean, myself too, I'm becoming becoming right i'm becoming i'm yeah. learning still learning who i am and that who i am is okay and yes we all have room for improvement so i'm not talking about like oh we're all born and we're all perfect no it's not that but accepting myself and really feeling like i do belong in the spaces in which i operate and i'm thinking wow what would it have been like if i had come to that realization as a child and how can i now create a home atmosphere where my children don't have to wait until they're in their 40s to become and to understand that there's a place in the world for them and you know as much as i focus on them and making sure that they're okay the whole purpose of that is when children feel rooted that helps them to spread wide branches out to others and that's where the idea of the kinship that i talk about in the book comes from so I'm also discussing how we can model activism and really engaging in our communities with our children. And so it's not so much a, you know, there's a risk if I only talk about one side that it's all about our children and massaging you and making sure you feel so good about yourself and you can be self-centered, but no, it's yeah. so that they can be healthy, emotionally healthy and rooted so that from that place of health they can reach out to others and and feel connected to other people so i think yeah. that's kind of the, yeah. the the glue that holds it all together no you're exactly right because when we start out from a place and quite honestly i mean i grew up without my autism diagnosis i was diagnosed with just the adhd as a kid and so and i really didn't have many people in my life who really were like me yeah so i couldn't see that anywhere else and so that really does create a sense of an experience of trauma because you are constantly looking around for the people like you and you're constantly going okay there's no one else like me so there must be something wrong with me yeah and that's a horrible place to be trying to grow from um, especially with such a limited view of the world, because as children, I mean, even with the internet and our world expanding, children's worlds remain somewhat small and sheltered just because they're limited in what they can gain access to. Sure, because you can't just let them loose into, no. yeah. So we may feel like, oh, there's plenty of people like you're, you know, and everything, but the child isn't experiencing that. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of times having the right words to put behind how you're feeling or how you show up in the world, how important that is. My mom was diagnosed with ADHD when I was in school, like I was in middle school or early high school, and it was cha life changing for her and for the rest of my family because just like my mom had spent her whole life feeling different I also had a mom that was a little different than the other moms on the block and I I never quite understood it either and so through her education I became very educated and she became this huge proponent and it became something that um instead of being something like what is up with her it 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 was I became enamored with her because I understand that that's who made that's part of what makes her who she is. And when I saw her embracing it and how happy she was, how filled with joy she was to finally understand this kind of missing piece that she had always felt, it made me joyful. And yeah. so she was able to go on and champion for other people in my family. Um, including my sister and brother, who also received diagnoses, and my niece and my and two of my nephews, and it, things have been so much more smooth for them because mm -hmm. they had this person in their home who saw them and said, mm -hmm. "I see you, and and I love you. I love what I see, and let me tell you more about this, and let's do this thing together. Let's live this mm -hmm. out together." And for the rest of us, we were all educated early on, so that our children and our families, my nieces, my niece and my nephews grew up always knowing that they belonged yeah and that you know those are the types of transformations that i'm really looking to help facilitate in homes and that's the the heart behind the book i love that i absolutely love that and now a word from our sponsors hi everyone so are you a person and if you are a person, do you sometimes feel like maybe you don't always belong? 
Or maybe do you know somebody else in your life who feels like they don't always belong? If that's the case, then this book is for you. It's called A Place to Belong, and it's written by Amber O'Neill Johnston. Amber is one of my absolute favorite people because I love the message that she is putting into the world that we need to honor who we are and to work on becoming who we are so that we can grow strong roots and so that we can go out into the world and branch out and have positive, healthy relationships with others. I love that this is a book that creates all kinds of interesting conversations, whether it's about when we feel like we don't belong because we look different or because we worship different or because we think different or because we learn different, any kind of difference. This is the book for you. Go out and get it and then join me in my special needs membership as we discuss it as authentically as possible. I told my mom actually recently, I told her, you know, when you are able to be your most authentic self, it actually helps me to be my authentic self because a part of me comes from you. Yeah. And well, so when I see you loving you and being you, it helps me to be able to see what's beautiful and lovely about who I was made to be, even though we're not the same there's still some things that I get either through genetics or just experience that I understand better when I see her understanding her better. So I think that's such an awesome thing to think about that it's not just about our kids. It's about how we are, you know, showing up for ourselves, who we are becoming. Yes. And when we're becoming, they're able to become better. It's so true. And you know what? When people read this book, they're going to think this was a setup, Amy. So you just said you hadn't read it, but I part of the book, I spend the whole first part talking and expounding on what you just said. That before we can even start digging into what we're going to create for our children, because we're all very motivated to do that. Like, oh, so I want to make this for my children. I'm going to do this for our children. That we have to do the work within ourselves. And one of the questions I ask people, how are you showing up? How are you experiencing life in a way that shows that you're comfortable with who you are, with the way that you look? Yes. But with the people that you come from? Yes. With the unique aspects of yourself that may not show up in this combination anywhere else. Um, and, you know, I really spend time working through that in the very beginning because I agree with you. Uh, a big part of having a place to belong is authenticity. Children can sense um, hypocrisy and falsehoods and all of that, no matter how much we want to present and pretend. And yes, so we start really forming this type of childhood that I'm proposing in the book, we have to be willing to come from an authentic place where we've done and are going to continue doing the work yeah. within ourselves. Oh, yeah. Well, and that's also something that I tell parents all the time. I'm like, look, if you can't do this for yourself, then do it for your children. Yeah, <laughs> because yes. we'll do things for our children. Um, I was talking with Julie Ross the other day from A Gentle Feast. Yes. She's like, yeah, go to the gym for your children. You're right. Go to yoga for your children. Whatever you got to tell yourself, just make yeah. it happen. <laughs> no, it's real. You know, you do think about that. And, and I think I do that all the time. There are so many times where people are like, oh, you do this with your kids and you do that with your kids. And I just really admire you. And I'm like one social media girlfriend. Okay. So I am not putting up pictures of me going like, put your shoes on. You know? <laughs> so that is, you know, uh, it's a curated experience. Yes, it's all real. It's not that any of that is not happening, but I'm not showing you the other days. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as a part of that, um, I am constantly, the things that you are seeing, I'm coaching myself for that. Like, okay. I, I, I do want to get out and spend the whole day in the mountains this morning. I do want to splash in this waterfall. I do want to wear this swimsuit enthusiastically and comfortably without making any comments, negative comments about my body. Like I do want to do all these things for my kids and they are great motivators. Mm -hmm. um, it, it works, right? So I agree with you and Julie, whatever you got to tell yourself that, that, you know, you can, that can get you to see that you're worth investing in because your children are watching you. Oh yeah. 
Yeah, and they pick up on those lessons that we pass down. So if we think that we are not valuable enough to take a break when we're tired, they're going to internalize that message. And then one day they're going to be adults with their children and they're going to be really tired. And instead of taking that break, they're going to keep working until they're exhausted or snap at someone or something like that. So yes, yeah. that's definitely true. You know, that's a good example specifically because I, um, early on in motherhood, I rarely uh, was like spending time with my friends aside from when we were with our um, children, like for play dates. Oh my gosh, my kids are just picking up on there. There's commotion out here. That's okay. I'm really shocked. Mine haven't either. <laughs> um, and so I was rarely spending any time with my friends alone and it was okay. Like I wasn't pining away for it or anything, but um, I ended up making friends with a couple of girlfriends who really valued that. And they kept asking me like, come on, let's go to coffee. Let's go to tea. Let's do this. And I'm like, oh, fine. And I went and my husband encouraged me. He's like, just go see what it's like. And I loved it. I was so filled up and I was like, this is different than a park play date and I, I want this in my life you know and I, I they were like we told you and so I realized wow this little thing that I did early Saturday morning with these women and the conversations we had and the tea that tasted so great and I enjoyed all of it that it filled me up and made me um behave differently towards my children all week long and so I realized that 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 when mama is healthy that pours out into that that flows into her home and how important it is and even my husband he was like oh i love this amber you need to go out with your girls every weekend you know so it was yeah. really good i think that's a great example amy well and that's a perfect lead in to the fact that i have a special needs membership group at the charlotte mason plenary where all of these other moms get online and we will discuss books, do Q and A's, talk about life. Last night, they got a demonstration of what we do when we have a meltdown. So my daughter acted one out and I got to show them exactly how that goes down. And they were like, oh, I'm not doing it wrong. I'm like, no, you're doing great. Oh, <laughs> this is as good as it gets. <laughs> Yeah, but um, so we are going to be discussing your new book like the week after it comes out. Because I told him, I'm like, go ahead and pre-order because we're going to start as soon as it comes out. <laughs> well, I'm so excited to hear that. I'm really looking forward to being able to engage with you guys and to get mm -hmm. feedback. And I think to have these rich discussions that mm -hmm. need to be had, but I'm not sure um, that we've had necessarily the safe spaces always to have these kind of tough conversations and be oh, this will do that yeah. trust me we wear, we wear we wear weird hats or cosplay or wigs so that's kind of a thing because we like our east east coast friends to feel comfortable in pajamas oh but so, yeah we are extremely authentic <laughs> I'm all about it. Okay. I'm all about it. I love it. And I really Make appreciate sure you wear your that. Yeah. I appreciate that you guys are interested in reading it and engaging in it with me. Um, and I definitely think, um, I don't think you'll be disappointed. I don't think so. <laughs> uh, I'm extremely excited. Um, and that actually leads me to one more super exciting announcement that I have not released yet. Okay. Um, you and I had a conversation about this a while back. Um, but this fall and spring, I'm going to be teaching a class called Jewish Cultural History at the Charlotte Mason Plenary Co-op. And we've been bouncing ideas back and forth about, you know, how we can do that in a beautiful way. So I'm super excited. I get to read the book before I teach the class. <laughs> that's so. good. It will definitely tie into that. And um, that's something that I think is really cool. Somebody asked me, well, who is this book for? And I said, well, it's for you. And she's like, well, how do you know? And I was like, because I wrote it with you in mind. Well, we just met. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. It's for mm -hmm. all parents. And so I love like the way that I wrote it. You can take whatever connects with you, what makes your family um, unique or different, and these words will speak to you. So the fact that you can read this first before you start planning your classes, I think that you'll see a lot of connection there, um, despite the fact that, you know, I'm not Jewish. <laughs> yeah. And I think that that's the beauty of this type of living and is that, um, it reminds me a lot of Charlotte Mason's principles that in a lot of ways it's applicable 
Um, it's a type of, it's a way of life. It's not a specific recipe. And so no. I, I really look forward to hearing your thoughts on it. And I look forward to learning more and seeing the manifestation of your class. It's so exciting and so needed. Oh, yes. I'm hoping that this is the first of many. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the idea uh, also from Charlotte Mason that we need to emphasize what's beautiful. Um, that's something that I tell parents all the time in consults when we're going through different subjects and stuff, especially when I come to like a subject like Bible or religion. I'm like, I don't care what perspective you're coming at this from. Share with your children what is beautiful about whatever tradition you have and don't worry about the rest. Yeah. If they see something as beautiful, they're going to love it and they're going to want it in their lives. If they don't see it as beautiful, they're not. No, I think that's true. And, and, and they're also going to feed off of your enthusiasm and your excitement about this beautiful thing. You know, I talk about like art museums and people are like, well, how do you, your kids go to the art museum and aren't they bored? And, and I'm like, well, one, we don't try to cover the whole entire museum in one day, but no, because we've already talked about what we're going to see there. And we're like, it's like a scavenger hunt almost. We're looking, we're going to the third floor. Is this it? We're turning here. We walk in and we see what we were looking for and we see this beautiful thing that perhaps we had only had a, a, a mere copy of at home or we had seen on a screen and the children just sit there and stare. That's mm -hmm. intentional. They're feeding off of my excitement and wonder, but also they're feeding off of the relationship that they've mm -hmm. already developed with this beautiful thing. And we just decide what those things are. And so, you know, for me, I'm calling for an expansion of what our community considers beautiful. Yes. And, you know, that's that's really it's not a change in what we're doing, but just an expansion. I love that. And we're going to leave it at that because I can't think of anything else that is better to end on than the idea of trying to expand what we see as beautiful. I think that's that's like it in a nutshell. So Amber, thank you so much for coming on the podcast with me today and telling us all about your book. We are super excited to read it in our special needs membership group. If you're not in the special needs membership group and you want to discuss the book with us and show up in your PJs or in a funny hat or a cosplay costume, we are more than happy to have you. We take anybody who feels like they think they could benefit and who wants to show up and be authentic with us. Wow. <laughs> any rate, we will see you guys next time. Thanks for joining us. Bye.